Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Navalny. We're going to talk about what really happened in uh, Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, if you could call that an interview. We're going to look at some of the mistakes uh, Putin made intentionally or unintentionally about Russian history. And we're going to talk about uh, Navalny's martyrdom and how that affects Putin's future. Wow, exciting. This is really a lot to get your arms around. And for this, we have uh, Dr. Rupmati Khandekar, uh, who joins us to discuss geopolitical uh, geopolitical analysis. That's what she does. And uh, we're going to discuss all of those factors right here, right now, here on Global Connections. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay, and thank you for having me. And I just enjoy interacting with you, as always. Looking forward to this day. You know, this, this got me started with uh, an, an article by Tim Snyder, a uh, history professor at Yale, who talked about, you know, Navalny and the interview with uh, Tucker Carlson. Um, and he, he went through, um, you know, a lot of the factual errors and mistakes, unintentional or intentional, that Putin made in his uh, monologue that he gave for a couple hours in that interview. And, um, it, you know, you realize after, after, after a while that, he, that Tucker Carlson was irrelevant to that. He was just being used mm -hmm. by Putin. Uh, and the, and the point of the interview was to provide a platform for Putin to tell the Russian people, and of course it was broadcast to the Russian people, uh, it was uh, done for them, and the world uh, about Russian history. Your thoughts about the Russian history that Putin sees as opposed to the real Russian history? Jay, uh, the Carlson interview that we saw, Dr. Carlson, take the background first, that he is very, uh, he is a, a, a pro-Republican right, right now, and this he provided Putin after 24 years of uh, his presidency. This is the first time I think Putin has come on to and given a full-fledged interview to the Western media, spanning over almost two hours. And in that, uh, Jay, we see that he is very determined the 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 uh, calm and composed manner that Putin gives the interview with he is unfazed. He he talks. He starts with the history. He starts from eight hundred and eighty uh, from the Vikings. And uh, when he talks about the Viking prince coming and uh, inaugurating this Ukraine, uh, no centers of uh, power in Russia. He traces immediately. He traces Ukraine to being an integral part of Russia. So he starts on strong note that, you know, he, Ukraine has always been part of Russia. Then he talks about Christianity. Christianity in that, Jay, when he's talking to the Western world, he's appealing to the religious sense. He's, you know, we are right now in such a phase of international politics that there is lots of religionism that is on the forefront. You know, you have a lot of antagonism between religions. You have people taking sides. And when he talks about Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, he presents himself to be pious. And, uh, you know, there is one comparison he makes with Prince Vladimir, uh, who uh, accepted uh, Orthodox Christianity. He, in, at the end of the interview, he compares himself, you know, in his mind, in his mental mind, he is talking of himself being in that position of religion uniting Russia. Uh, he talks about power being together. And Jay, the stages that this, uh, inter he is a thorough diplomat. He has spoken everything he wants to speak with. Because every line has been countered. Every line has been supported by something. And he is a master written in art. You understand 24 years of statesmanship brings out the best in you. He has just invaded a country. But he talks as if he's giving a, a Hollywood actor's interview. It's just another movie for him. It's just another face for him. And uh, that kind of uh, grit that he has is uh, unbelievable, Jay, because what he talks about, he, um, he justifies Ukraine, uh, the war against Ukraine. He talks about the coup d'etat in Ukraine that, uh, happened. He talks about uh, NATO in a full-fledged manner, Jay, and that we have to cover up in a bit uh, why he speaks about NATO. And uh, Jay, he presents himself as such a accommodate 
statesman. He even talks of Russia. Uh, he talking to Bill Clinton and asking him if Russia could join NATO. The entire uh, aim of NATO was to stop uh, Russian aggression. And when you have Russia itself wanting verbally to say, we want to join NATO, the purpose of NATO is served. And that is such a big thing coming from uh, 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 Putin Jay that he came forward to ask that can he join NATO? So this kind of accommodating uh, and bargaining presentation of himself that he gave in the interview is so it hits you in your face when you're watching it and analyzing it. And this Putin's strategy of saying that he's open to dialogue. He, when he says that he's open to join NATO, you know, all aggression, all um, criticism of him goes to because you're, 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 you have a man who's wanting to join with no ego. That's how he presents himself. Can you believe what he is, uh, uh, you know, he's portraying uh, a very calm, com composure was what he brought out in this interview. That's what. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, I don't want to talk too much about Tucker Carlson because I consider Tucker Carlson a lowlife. He has always <laughs> been a lowlife. Uh, but, you know, why, why did Putin use him uh, and why did he come to Russia to be used? Uh, and what was in it for Tucker Carlson and what did he mean to the American audience? I mean, it seems to me, you know, that, he, that Tucker Carlson represents Trump. Tucker Carlson represents the, the viewership of Fox News that is the base. Tucker Carlson is, stands for something. Uh, he is a, an icon for the base and for Trump. And so it seems to me like the, the meaning of having Tucker Carlson there is to say, Trump loves me uh, through Tucker Carlson. Your, your thoughts about what talk Tucker Carlson meant uh, as a participant in that interview, interview in quotes, because it wasn't really an interview. But what was Putin trying to establish by agreeing to meet with Tucker Carlson? Jay, we have seen in the recent times that propaganda plays such a huge role in uh, international politics. And this was his propaganda. This was his presentation of his image to the Western world. Uh, People like us, we will study and uh, research about him. But uh, generally, uh, people would not know about Putin. And when he talks on a stage like this, you kind of see a different man to what we are being presented. We are, we are, we are being presented a media tyrant. We are being presented a person who is not willing to negotiate. Here, in the interview, he presents himself as a, a statesman who claims that Ukraine was always an integral part of Russia. He claims that, you know, he is willing to negotiate. He is willing to join the NATO. He is very pro-American. Uh, this He points out, uh, uh, points out that de-dollarization is a wrong policy of, uh, wrong policy of the American statesman. Uh, and, you know, he has brought out one, one point that the administration and the president are not connected. The decision that the president makes, his administration uh, would uh, put it down. So when the presidents are telling him that they're willing to negotiate, the administration tells them, no, they can't do it. So he's bringing out these loopholes in American administration. And that on the world stage, you know, it's a bit confidential. <laughs> Whatever you say, American policy runs through precedents. It's, it runs in a linear line, irrespective of who the president is. American policy always keeps America at its prime importance. Well, it should, so, anyway. Yes. <laughs> you know, it strikes me that Tucker Carlson <clears throat> really didn't participate in that interview. Mm. He, just, he provided a, a platform, a, a symbol of uh, Trump and the Republican Party for um, Putin to talk to. And um, through him, you know, Putin was talking to a good part of the United States. I mean, if anybody would listen to it. Um, but, you know, what strikes me is that in just sitting there um, without interacting, without questioning Putin, without even asking him questions, without holding him to account on his 
factual mistakes and misstatements. Um, Carlson was effectively repeating it. He was effectively agreeing with what Putin said. He was part of the propaganda. Don't you right. agree? Absolutely, absolutely. Point on, Jay. This was such a brilliant point that you brought up that there was no interviewer, interviewee. It was just a speech. And Tucker was the audience, isn't it? There was nothing. Uh, he was not questioning, was not counter. There was no inquiry. He never asked him about human rights. He never asked him about the violations. He never talked about uh, aggression. What Putin was saying, he was listening. And he was yeah. just taking. He was not driving the interview to conclusions or to any point. It was just as Putin wanted. Putin gave a history of uh, the Russian uh, Russian state. He gave uh, uh, that in 1940, uh, 2014, uh, NATO went for expansion. You know, uh, 1999, he was promised no NATO expansion. 2014, there were five waves of expansion. He's giving out his side of the story. There is no countering him. There was no debate. There was no... Uh, facts. There was nothing. It was straight on, uh, giving him just a platform to voice his opinion. And you know that story that he picks up, and he tells that when the Russians were telling the Ukrainians that uh, surrender right now, otherwise you will die. And from the other side, the Ukrainian soldiers shouted out that we are Russians, we don't surrender. So he is trying to say Ukraine and Russia, there is no difference. Ah, uh, yeah. He, he, and, then, and, and meanwhile, he's, you know, he's uh, got an arrest warrant out against him uh, by the International Court. But let me, let me go to uh, something that, you know, that you, you, you imply um, about this whole affair that is in a larger context. And that is he either had killed Navalny by then or he was planning to kill Navalny by then. And I suggest to you that this interview was a way to change the subject. Uh, Putin is a master propagandist. And by the way, propaganda means lying, is what it means. Yes. He's, a, he's a master liar, uh, uh, perhaps more effective in his own way than Trump is, because Trump always gets caught. But you know, the, the press as it is in Russia doesn't necessarily catch Putin when he lies. Uh, and he lies about everything. Well, so here we have, uh, the Navalny thing, the interview thing, um, the war thing, uh, and we have the, uh, what do you want to call it, the uh, ineffectiveness of our Congress thing, all these things working together, and right in the middle of it, okay, is this interview. So my question to you, and it's a larger question, is uh, it, how about that? Um, can Navalny be a martyr? Can Yulia, his wife, Navalny, actually continue the tradition of standing up for democracy in Russia, of being a, a political leader? You know, he died. He was killed. This is martyrdom, really. And the question is whether Putin can bury that martyrdom with, with all his propaganda that he's organizing. A hard yeah, question. Hard question. Very hard question. Because uh, we have uh, mass graves in Ukraine and he doesn't care about life. So uh, it's just about the aim, the objective, and the aim and objective of a, a leader who has absolute power cannot have opposition, Jay. It's the truth of uh, uh, statehood that the opposition is always uh, trampled and uh, defeated to such an extent that they don't rise again. And uh, the revolution happens when there is a waning of power. Right now, he is at the pinnacle of his power. He is, he is into, uh, he is um, master de-dollarization. He has a weak uh, American uh, economy. He has a friend in China. He has got uh, a, a Middle East which is unstable. He's got the uh, oil and gas supply of Europe. He is, he is at a. a height of things, Jay. So, and you know, you have a promise of a friend in Trump coming up. So that kind of strengthens him. And if there was an opposing leader or strong leader coming and would have said, you know, you cannot do this and go back to your country and you can't uh, transgress, Navalny 
uh, leaders like Navalny would have had a chance. But there is no saving these people right now. We know how ha hapless the situation is because uh, justice in the international system is always a uh, subsidiary to power. Always. It's just the rule of the law. Rule of the land, rule of the jungle. What do you call mm -hmm. it? That. Yeah. Okay. I think you. I think you stated that very well. So. So here we have um, Navalny's memory. We have Yulia. Uh, she faced them down. You know, on the body. Right. Yeah. The, the, they were saying the the prison system in um, you know Siberia uh, was saying, and of course that's that's uh, Putin speaking, uh, that they're not going to give her the body unless. She agrees to a secret funeral, yeah. mm. and um, and she said, "No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I want the body because I want to examine the body, uh, and I want to yeah. bury the body in a in a public spectacular funeral, and and and, and the examination of the body is very important because yeah. when when he was given Novacek a couple of years ago." Um, the Russian authorities held him until uh, the the poison uh, was out of his body, so he couldn't prove that he had mm. been poisoned. I thought that was curious, and maybe this was more of the same. Maybe this was Novacek again, um, and they wanted to hold the body so nobody could examine the body and and find out what what poison was involved. Of course, it might have been even worse. Uh, you know, that, that particular prison camp was the worst of the Siberian, the Gulag archipelago, and and um, the, uh, the regular torture was taking place, and undoubtedly he was tortured. But, you know, the, 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 the problem for Putin is the day before he appeared, and he seemed to be healthy. So all of a sudden he's dead the next day. What, what happened there? So there's a fair chance that it was either, you know, brutal beating, or poison. And if it was poison, she, Yulia, wanted to know what was in his body. So they held on to the body. In fact, they held on to the body for way more than the 48 hours uh, for the dissipation of the poison. But anyway, she faced them down. And um, they agreed that uh, they would give her the body. And she did not agree that it would be a secret funeral. So we have a martyr uh, who is being celebrated in Russia. Um, and I guess the question is whether that's reaching the people. You know, you spoke about, uh, you know, uh, Russian soldiers dying. And indeed, you know, there's a, there's a morale problem. Uh, Putin has to look far and wide for new recruits. And uh, yes. people who lose their, their sons, uh, they're not really happy about the way this war is going. And so uh, what you have is a, is a uh, kind of undercurrent of um, of dissension in Russia, hard to express yourself because you'll be arrested, and indeed hundreds, thousands of people have been arrested for dissenting against the war and and put in jail for oh gee was long periods of time, and that does filter around. It may not get public on the press in Russia because he's always using the propaganda of the television, state television, um, but it, I'm sure it's a subject of discussion over the dinner table in many households in Russia. So it, it's, a, it's a tension, right? It's a tension where he's doing this propaganda thing, trying to change the subject, trying to come off as a good guy and a strong man, <clears throat> trying to use people like Tucker Carlson and Trump uh, to elevate himself um, you know, beyond the, the brutality that he creates. At the same time, um, that brutality comes out. So it's a attention in terms of world opinion. Um, you know, I don't think his propaganda is completely successful, but it's largely successful. And Trump is repeating it in this country. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Putin is using threats in Europe. So to the extent that, uh, you know, Europe re reacts, responds, the EU wants to raise money. I don't know if it's done that yet. Um, and Macron even said, we, we don't take anything off the table. We may put boots in the ground to help the Ukrainians. Um, there's, there's a lot of things happening, you know, that, that favor Ukraine here. But the problem is that Ukraine has problem getting recruits, too. Uh, the Ukraine yeah. has lost a lot of people. Ukraine, you know, poor people are 
you know, are suffering and uh, morale is low. Morale is low in uh, Zelensky's army. Um, but on the other hand, it's also low in Putin's army. It's a war of attrition on both sides. And so this is really a tipping point kind of thing. And I think Putin sees that. Um, you know, the sanctions have not had that much effect, but they've had some effect. Uh, and people are, you know, maybe arguably getting it in Russia, but it's still an inflection point. It's still hanging in the balance. And that's why I say this is a very difficult question. And somehow, Tucker Carlson's, quote, interview is part of the propaganda, um, you know, that, that, that Putin is using, is availing himself of, um, to, to tilt it in his favor to hold on to the loyalty of the people who watch state TV uh, in Russia and, uh, and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump's base to try to get them on board. So we have a, a world confusion uh, which, which Putin has, has created and is trying to create. Um, your thoughts about that, your thoughts about which way is this going to tilt and what will it take? You know, this, we live in a world where things happen every day that could change the calculus. So Ooh. I can't ask you to make a prediction. All I can tell you is that we will we identify the factors that could come up and see what it looks like in the next nine months. If Trump gets elected, this is fait accompli. Putin <laughs> will win, you know? Um, so the question okay. is, what are, the, what are those factors? Right, right, Jay, right. Um, Jay, headlines hit that Putin has given his first interview. Navalny was not that much in the headlines, wasn't it? He was receded to the background. So this kind of timing that Putin has is a matter of experience that he has. 24 years of absolute power, and I repeat, because that man has got such a hold on uh, world politics. The way he is uh, analyzing world politics is in a different way, Jay. Uh, he is looking at it from a vantage point. And uh, Ukraine, um, I told you in the first, first interview that we had in on Ukraine, that as a general, Zelensky should have little bit, you know, receded into the background, held his camp to fight another day, regroup. He went head on to the Russian uh, army. The Russian army is huge. You have to take logistics into account. How much would these... Uh, countries from outside fund uh, Zelensky. How much of that funding would not go into corruption? Corruption has gone rampant, Jay. We had headlines hitting that a journalist, Egyptian journalist who reported that Zelensky's mother-in-law bought a multi-million uh, house in Egypt was slaughtered. He is also betting in this kind. The money would have reached uh, the proper points. Russia would have had a formidable opponent. But that corruption channels are still rampant over there too. So, uh, you know, that kind of uh, imbalance that is happening uh, gives Putin another added advantage. And in war, you, you know that, that a small advantage would lead to a victory, ultimate victory. And he is garnering support with so much of patience, Jay. You forget mass graves, you forget war crimes, you forget genocide, you forget all these terms, and you just focus on how. Uh, he has been able to garner support even in the face of aggression on Ukraine. Yeah, he's invoked his religion, everything. Yeah, everything he can. And, and so everything. you have to wonder, you have to wonder when you see the full court press like this, the full court press is to, you know, kill Navalny, at the same time mm -hmm. change the subject, take advantage of his expertise with the news cycle and propaganda. But, you know, I have to ask you this, Rupati, it, when he's using all these factors, all these efforts at changing the subject and making himself look good, isn't there an element of desperation? Could you make the case that he sees himself losing the Russian people, that he sees the EU and NATO getting stronger? And they just brought Sweden in. That was interesting. Uh, although although uh, Victor or Orban extracted a promise uh, that Sweden would give him some jets and uh, would would open a factory uh, in uh, in 
in Hungary. Um, but fact is that Sweden is now a member of NATO. Uh, that one, you know, happened. And so there are things that could make Putin desperate. And of course, he would never admit that he was desperate. But do you see a spate of things here that suggest that Putin's, um, you know, heavy propaganda of late uh, is, is, is reflects a certain desperation? Gee, desperation um, uh, to an extent, but smartness to a larger extent, because he has shown the Russian people that he interacts with the Western world. He's shown the Western people that he's open to negotiations. He has shown his allies that uh, we are in a de-dollarization country, and we are having, you know, uh, he talks of uh, economic prospects. He talks of... Uh, America not as an enemy, but as a potential ally. That kind of uh, mind that he plays with, he talks that he himself had uh, uh, transactions of over 50 cent in dollars. And right now, because of the sanctions, it's reduced to 13%. And we would have loved to do a trade in dollars, but now because of the sanctions, we're not able to. So the recession in America is because of Russia not being able to do trade in dollars. I in, imagine uh, you have a, a cramped budget and you're listening to Putin say this. You're going to feel like, hey, Putin, please deal in dollars. So that uh, that level that he puts forth and that, uh, you know, the carrot that he presents is hiding the stick that he has in such a <laughs> good manner that... Uh, we forget, I mean, literally, even uh, we, we study Ukraine, we, we see the footage, we see everything, but here you're watching him talk sense of geopolitics. So that is such a fast day. Facade, facade, facade is the only Yeah, well, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, I think the movie was Manhattan um, by Woody, uh, Woody Allen, and, uh, uh, and it was... Uh, it celebrated Marshall McLuhan, who said huh. back when that the media is the message. So yes. uh, it, that that translates into the propaganda is the reality, you know. And and uh, I think we have that. You know, what if you have enough propaganda coming at you, that's what you believe. That's what that's it becomes the reality. <laughs> but I want to go into one more thing before we run out of time, and, and that is. Um, a friend of mine sent me a link to a Navalny production about Putin's DACA, um, and it is extraordinary. It is uh, in Russian. It goes on for well over an hour. Um, it is um, Navalny's handiwork, and it is a major effort at examining, researching and producing Putin's corruption. And it focuses on his enormous and secret estate, which cost billions, if not a trillion dollars to build. It is huge. And it has every technological and surveillance technique imaginable so that nobody can get in, um, nobody can find out what's going there. Um, but in fact, uh, Navalny had friends who worked on it, and they reported to him about exactly what was inside. And it was the best of the best of the best, and it cost a fortune. And it was just, it is just huge. Um, of course, Putin has layers of oligarchical ownership um, that you know, distance the, the ownership control, of, you know, the development of this huge uh, facility from him, but it's clear enough from the video that uh, Putin created this himself. It is absolutely regal. It is, uh, yes. you've never seen, never seen anything like it. And, and Navalny has the goods. He has the research. He has the details. He has the facts. He has clips. He has, um, you know, um, he has uh, mock-ups of what's inside. So <clears throat> this was uh, circulated to YouTube. It is on YouTube now. And when my friend sent it to me, he said, this explains why Putin had to kill Navalny. Navalny. 
because Navalny is, is, is revealing Putin's corruption, which is on a, an incredible level, far beyond anything we ever contemplated. <clears throat> and he is raping the Russian economy, raping the Russian people to build this extraordinary um, Dacha. And so um, I guess I'm asking, uh, oh, and I put this on our website so people could um, look at it. It's in Russian, but the word is that it's being translated and it, it will be uh, ultimately available in English. And uh, there are titles, there are subtitles in English uh, against the Russian. Um, Navalny didn't do this himself. He had to have a lot of help. He had some real professionals building this right down to the production values of it. It was, it is impressive. So what I'm saying is, um, do you agree, uh, assuming what I've said about this this video is correct, um, that 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 Putin, if for no other reason. He had to kill Navalny, Navalny to stop this, you know, this report of the scandal. Your thoughts? Yeah, Jay. Uh, for Navalny's work to have an uh, impact or a fruitful outcome, like a change of regime, you had to have a democracy. It's a, you know, it's a totalitarian. Uh, um, concept in Russia. They they are under a dictator. If you call it President Putin, he's got a total control over it. So the people don't have a say in it. There will be voices of dissent, but there is not a revolution which comes in because it's a socialist. They depend on the government for everything. They are... Uh, it's not like our democratic society where you have free will and, you know, uh, the larger the number of uh, people who come... You can do make a change. Here, voices and if the voices can be uh, shut, they are even if they're shut with force, there will not be opposing power. In fact, by seeing this, they will keep quiet, more quiet. It's like Mao's uh, uh, campaign of a thousand flowers. Uh, the way he bought out the people who dissented against him, they and he destroyed them. Nobody could say anything about him. His regime continued till he wanted. And that's the same with Putin. He will destroy all his opponents. Wagner's plane came down. It was one headline. But there was nothing, you know, he can destroy opposition as he wants. And he still presents himself as a statesman, as a ruling, uh, um, what is that? You can call legitimate ruler of Russia and making Russia great again. That is his... Uh, that is his political experience and his authority only from experience. Well, he's certainly trying to distance himself from this video, just as he does, you know, social media, destructive social media in other countries, especially the U.S., just as he, uh, and we know that he tried to, and successfully, uh, affect yes. public opinion and, and the vote here in 2016, 2016 and 2020. Um, I believe, and he will do it in November the same way. This video will go worldwide if it hasn't already, and it will affect public opinion. I don't think that people in the U.S. know about this video, really. I yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I don't know if, if Russia, you know, the people in Russia know about this video, but this is the kind of martyrdom video that, that is the legacy of uh, Alexei Navalny. This is his message to the world. You better watch out for this guy. Just like Bob Mueller said at the conclusion of the Mueller report, you better watch out for this guy. Um, he's, he's ripping you off and he's perverting everything in your system uh, to be a, an absolute dictator. It, make, it makes the czars look lightweight. Uh, yes. really does. So I guess I'd like to just in, in the last part of our show here, I'd like to uh, you know just examine the the relationship, uh, and and uh, Heather Cox Richardson has written about this, the relationship between uh, Putin and and Trump. You know when Navalny's death was reported, Trump said he reported it as the sudden death of Navalny, and that's all he said. 
And then he said, yes. this, and then he compared Navalny to himself uh, as a, you know, a, state, a statement of those who love democracy. Um, it, was, it was so outrageous. He never condemned the killing. Uh, he never spoke about what it meant as, as you know, in, in, in Russian politics, never said a word. And, and it, it, again, it, it bespeaks of Trump's subordination uh, to Putin. Putin is running the show. Trump is following yes. along. Putin has something on Trump. We don't know what it is, but it's something, a compromise of some kind. And Trump belongs to Putin. And Putin will help Trump win. It's in his interest in November. He's already helping him win with social media. And, and you know, the, the strange thing about social media is you can't tell what is being said to whom. You can't tell the psychology, the social psychology that is being employed by, by the Internet Research Agency in Moscow uh, against American voters. So we don't know. But we can surmise pretty well that Putin is already active in American politics for this election and for state elections as well. So my question is, just exactly how much is Trump indebted to Putin? Just exactly how much Putin controls Trump? And it's a matter of, we don't really know, but we can connect the dots. Your thoughts about that? There was such a speculation, Jay, that the first election was won, uh, won because of Putin's help, Russian help. And uh, Jay, if you see the trajectory that Putin wants to portray Russia onto, he talks about NATO being a very subdued power. Here we have a corresponding uh, uh, president of the United States who talks about the end of NATO and let them do whatever they want. And, you know, uh, Ukraine will not have an ally of funding in the U.S. like they're having under the Biden administration. It will change under Trump if he's not funding for climate. You think he will fund a, a country in uh, um, uh, Eastern Europe, and, uh, which is against Russia? He will not. He will not want to go in the bad books of Putin. They like um, a photo op better than, you know, talking of uh, the righteous and the moral uh, right to rule, they will go to any extent to get power. Power hungry, authoritarian, and uh, Jay, taking any means to achieve the ends is what uh, is the common factor between those, these two leaders. And they are coming into power together. That is a point to think about because Trump is looks inwards in uh, politics. He looks at only American nationalism or American progress, he does not give that much importance to international politics. That is for a fact. He wants American economy to improve. He wants everything inward. He will not bother what Russia is doing in Ukraine. And that gives Putin all the more space to maneuver and to put stamp his authority over there. And he all will right, rule. We're, we're out of time, Ramadi. We got to go. But uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> These are great thoughts, important thoughts. We will continue this conversation, Dr. Rupmati Khandakar, joining Thank us you. to see what about that interview and what about Navalny's death, his killing. Thank you so much, Rupmati. Thank you. Aloha, Ajay. Thank you so much. Aloha.